Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Beyond any doubt, the Iranian Ibex is one of the most magnificent members of the goat family. Its huge curving horns with which it battles with rival bucks are among the most striking in appearance in the Wild Kingdom. A resident of the relatively arid mountains of Asia Minor, the Ibex shares its habitat with another superbly horned animal, the Uriel sheep which in appearance is somewhat similar to the North American bighorn sheep, but with a heavy ruff of fur at the throat. Although not quite as sure-footed as the ibex in scaling the craggy cliffs, it still lives in the same area. Usually, both species are difficult to observe, but they become less shy during the rut, which is when they're breeding. That's when the annual surveys are made, and recently we were invited by the Iranian Department of the Environment to join the survey, which also keeps alert for any indication of poaching. Our journey took us here to the extensive range called the Elbers Mountains, forming the northern border of Iran. We had to travel by plane, truck, and horseback to get to where the animals live, a place we called the Land of the Ibex. <laughs> Although it is early autumn, a sifting of snow has settled over the tops of the Elbers Mountains. Our plane is finally approaching the place where we'll land in the foothills on the other side of these mountains. This Elbers range is the home of the Uriel sheep and Ibex we'll be observing. With me in the plane is our pilot Fred Harrington and Habib Sheikh, an administrative official of the Iranian Department of the Environment. Fred's starting now to make his final bank for the approach to the small dirt landing strip where we'll be putting down. As arranged for beforehand by radio, our driver is already on hand waiting for us with his vehicle. We've come here from the capital city of Tehran and Habib has arranged for all the transportation we'll need to reach the area where the Ibex and Uriel sheep are located. That is still a considerable distance to go on the ground. This is the village of Ermadlo we're passing through now. Not big, but certainly picturesque. Not many visitors come here, so there's an obvious curiosity about us. After a short drive, we begun entering the rougher terrain of steeper foothills to the Elbers Mountains, and almost immediately, we are lucky enough to get a good look at one of the very shy, goitered gazelles which live here. The name goitered gazelle derives from the characteristic swelling of the throat. The tail held high is another recognizable characteristic. Like most antelopes, this species becomes easily alarmed. Now we've come to the point that is as far as we can go in the truck. From here, the way is all sharply uphill. The horses are already 
so we'll be able to start up to the heights right away. The truck will return later on to meet us, and my guide for the rest of the day will be wildlife biologist Ahmed Amir Abirahim of Iran's Department of the Environment. It will probably take us an hour or so to ride up to where the Uriel sheep and ibex are at this time of year. Both species prefer remaining close to the crests as long as the weather permits them to. In winter, however, when everything is heavily snow covered, they'll migrate down the slopes far enough to be able to find the food they need to sustain them. Food is never abundant. It's autumn right now, but even in spring, the new grasses quickly shrivel and brown under the fierce wind and sun. Ahmed comes into the mountain so often, he knows exactly where to find the animals. Those are some of the wild boars which roam these slopes in considerable numbers. There are no adult males in this herd, and the females are apparently concerned about getting their young away from here. The reason is immediately clear. It is a leopard. We are fortunate to see it, for even though they are abundant, they are shy of man. Obviously, it is not hunting, which means it has already killed. The leopards found here are the foremost natural enemy of the ibex and uriel sheep. Ahead, a golden eagle and some magpies have found the remains of the wild boar that the leopard walked away from after killing it and eating some. The big cat is, in fact, coming back right now to its kill. So the eagle gets out of the way. The ibex are at a higher elevation, and we still have a long climb ahead of us. We climbed steadily for an hour and finally reached an elevation where Hamid said we should begin seeing some of the ibex. The autumn air has been crisp, and the uphill ride very pleasant. Now Hamid points out the first of the animals we're looking for. Just ahead of us, there is a fine ibex, a large dominant male with horns curved like great sabers. Males this size rarely fight leaving that to the younger males, who are still testing themselves. Part of courtship involves a tongue-wagging motion by the male. This characteristic action by the buck is calculated to excite the female. Sometimes, after an interval, the buck may nudge her. At first, the female may not seem interested, but soon she responds, as he persists. Sometimes chases are vigorous, other times seemingly half-hearted, but they are all part of the courtship process. Sometimes a big male like this just displays the fullness and blackness of both his beard and mane. Studies show that most of the year, the females and males don't associate. Rutting lasts only a couple of weeks, 
So that's why the timing was crucial in our coming here to observe them together. When mating terminates, the males move back to the mountain crests as bachelor herds until the next rut, leaving the females and young to stay together. What is happening now is a process of selection going on as to which buck will get which females. The dominant males have had first choice. Younger males, like this one, sometimes have to fight for their selection with other young males. These particular animals have not yet reached the point of battling one another. It is possible that there may be other herds farther up the mountain that have reached a peak of belligerence, and we will be able to view that spectacular activity. With that in mind, Marlin and I will continue climbing toward the summit. It is possible we will encounter others which will provide us with greater rut action. We're now approaching a secluded little valley where Hamid has always before seen the Uriel sheep. There's a good chance we'll see them today too. So he suggests we approach quietly on foot in an effort to get a look at them. Their wariness is so pronounced that if they discover us nearby, they'll swiftly disappear. Our caution has been worthwhile. The first animals we see are a number of ewes and young, and there's no indication they're aware of our presence. We're in luck because there's a really magnificent ram who's just appeared. The characteristic thick neck ruffs are most spectacular at this time of year and have strips which are almost like black velvet. These are impressive to the females. There's a sense of tremendous controlled energy in his movements. A drama is developing. Some distance above, another leopard has appeared. If there is an indication that it is on the hunt, the sheep, which are still calm, will probably bolt out of this area. The rams stay keenly alert but thus far there is no indication that the herd senses danger. In fact, some are obviously engaging in rutting activities. Evidently, a certain sense of alarm has touched them, though not panic, and the main part of the herd begins moving away. The Urials are much like the bighorn sheep of the American Rockies, except that bighorns live 20 years. The lifespan for Urial sheep is only about nine years. And since rams don't compete for ewes until they are nearly five, breeding life is short. Just above us, another predator has appeared, but the golden eagle is a menace only during the spring when the newborn young of these huge Uriel sheep weigh a mere five pounds. When they've reached the size of these adults, about the only natural enemies they have are leopards and wolves. There's been no evidence of any poaching having occurred here. So Hamid and I will continue our ride up toward the crest, hoping to encounter some more of the Uriel sheep en route 
as well as some of the ibex engaged in their rutting battles. Oddly, though most often the Uriel sheep will plunge away instantly upon detecting danger, one ram watches our departure without fear, as if sensing that we are not enemies. We continued our ride up the mountain, still hoping to see, as we reached the summit, one of the most dramatic sights of nature in Iran. As we have progressed ever higher toward the crest of this range, we've several times heard the far distant sounds of horns striking one another and overturned rocks rattling down slopes. But as yet, we haven't come near any battles between rutting ibex males. The curiosity of a large ibex watching our approach is shared by a young ram and you. The horns of the females are seldom over a foot long, while those of the buck may easily reach 40 inches in length and grow several inches per year. It is just as we reach a more level area near the crest of this range that Hamid detects something unusual in the cliffs. It turns out to be the largest mammal found here, the brown bear. Though on rare occasions a bear like this may catch a sheep or goat, it can't really be considered a significant predator. Mostly it eats berries, roots, grass, and insects. Nearby, there's another golden eagle. It's a plentiful species here and identical to the golden eagle in America. It's just as impressive in flight. We're approaching the summit now, and the condition of the vegetation has changed somewhat from the lower regions. It's remarkable that these animals thrive so well in such harsh terrain, yet they're extremely well adapted to it and manage to find adequate nourishment in withered brown grasses, which from all appearances seem to have little food value. Yet it's nourishing to the species and it's their main diet. They grow large on it. It's not at all unusual for a male ibex to weigh 220 pounds, which is almost three times as much as the female. The ram hears the same thing we do, the sound of ibex fighting nearby. We are getting very close to the battle now from the sounds of it. Usually such fights are brief, but sometimes they last for an hour and a half. A careful approach should provide us a good view of the combatants, who are so involved in the struggle they haven't sensed that we are near.
Nearby, a female watches curiously as the two males fight for dominance. The object of such fighting is not to kill one another. The blows are always neatly parried by the combatants and the butting is rarely anything more than horn hitting horn. That activity is interspersed with periods of just shoving one another. Accidents sometimes happen and one of the males may get hurt but serious damage is very rare. The fight is ending, and we can consider ourselves fortunate to have been here at the right time. The day has sped by, and we have to return before darkness overtakes us. But we won't forget the wonders of nature we've observed here in the land of the Ibex. There are many species of sheep and goats in the world. Two of those found in Iran are among the most impressive, and that has been in the past a liability for both. The great curling horns of the Uriel sheep are spectacular and at one time greatly coveted by trophy hunters, as were the saber-like horns of the Iranian ibex. However, long ago the government of Iran placed strict controls on the taking of the ibex and the Uriel sheep, and as a result, neither is in jeopardy now. It's our responsibility to see that these animals and their habitat are afforded adequate protection. Only in this way can the governments of the world ensure that such beautiful animals may always remain a part of our precious wild kingdom.